You know, when, when you hear about the Delta Democrat times nowadays, people think of the hiding Carters, they think of civil rights, but actually civil rights was only a small part of the daily coverage of the Delta Democrat times. But well, he knows. I mean, this guy, this guy covered a vast swatch of territory for the Democrat times, but uh, I mean, we, we had a bureau up in Cleveland and uh, in the latter part of our time, we had bureau representatives uh, down in Jackson. And we were actually thought Stoneville was a huge beat. Well, the Delta Research Station out there with all of its PhDs and farm, farm agricultural research and a quite diverse set of people. Uh, I guess there was some board that my mother or my father didn't serve on, but I don't know what it was. I mean, I cannot conceive of one. And occasionally he'd be on one that they'd purge him out of because you know, he wrote an editorial that irritated somebody. But um, we, um, look, <laughs> reporters would fall over dead before they would do some of the coverage we would require, I mean, these days of supposed professional journalism. Well, you required your reporters to become members of all Damn civic right. clubs. Civic clubs. They had to go to civic clubs and they had to cover the programs. If you wanted to know, an almost unendurable pain is to cover some of the programs at civic clubs. But I did it as a member of the Lions. I did it as a member of the Civitan, a member of the Rotary, I mean, sequentially, and of the junior uh, JCs. And other reporters did all kinds of things. and. Uh, credulously reported what was said there, did not editorialize, snickering perhaps under our breath, but nonetheless covering it. And uh, you name it, we covered it. And it was a, a small component. But again, to remind you where we were, I had a circulation manager who was a tough old boy from Shreveport and an absolute total segregationist. And I'm sure in his last stop, before he got to us, had been a member of the Klan, and he all but said so. And whenever we'd have some positive story on the front page or an achievement of, by a black person or a story which gave the perspective of somebody in the movement, he'd walk into my office, he'd slam the papers down and say, I'm trying to build you up and all you do is keep cutting my throat with these goddamn stories and you gotta quit putting all this news in this paper. Fact, folks. The reason that we had the highest market penetration of any daily north of Jackson outside of Tupelo, Mississippi, was that members of that community, black community, actually thought that we treated them like people worthy of coverage and the paper therefore was worth reading, even though it was expensive given the amount of money they did not make in most of those homes. So we had a large black readership, relatively speaking. And I'm not mistaken, uh, the DDT was the only newspaper in Mississippi that printed black faces on its society pages, or at least well, the first. We were certainly the, fir we were certainly the first and, uh, and, and to do it consistently. And, okay, this is a famous story, my dad's multiple re repetition of autobiography. But um, a black woman came into his office uh, toward the end of the pre-war period and said, um, you're gonna have to tell me why it is that when a black married woman's name appears in the paper, she's only referred to either by her first and last name, Albertine Jones, or the Jones woman. Doesn't Mrs. just mean married woman? And so we became the first paper, not merely in Mississippi, but in the Deep South, to put the honorific Mrs. in front of a name to tell you how insane the system of segregation of white supremacy was. That was considered a threat to white integrity to speak of a married woman as a married woman and was resisted bitterly uh, in many places for a long time. Um, and that cost a little bit in circulation too. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like pathetic pathology, that that would be an issue. And it was pathetic pathology. And it is also pathetic that it took us so long to overcome it. I'm talking about the Democrat times, but we were way out front when we did it. There's a, there's a school of thought nowadays with newspapers being under fire, so to speak, uh, that maybe we should pull our punches a little bit 
write more positive stories. Don't be so critical because you don't want to lose readers. The DDT, in fact, despite all the other handicaps it had to uh, fight against, covered local government very aggressively, hmm. uh, uncovering meter reading scandals and, and supervisors playing games with roads across their own property and a, a lot of tough stories. Um, uh, and and how, did that, uh, how did that affect your circulation? You know, it's funny. I, um, somebody Curtis knows well, and is a major figure in investigative reporting, Cy Hirsch, uh, famously burns an awful lot of people, including some that uh, ultimately are good sources for him, uh, and gets away with it to some degree because people think, nonetheless, he's a place that they can get a story placed, and they come to him. Um, we uh, were aggressive, and of course, we're very aggressive in local politics and trying to deal with government as a, as a creature of the people rather than vice versa, and did a lot of it. Um, we didn't actually end up having any great favorites is one of the reasons we got away with it. I mean, that is, uh, people who were enemies on one issue would be friends on another, and we were in enough issues that it was possible we would make somebody happy and mad simultaneously, but but uh, they could come, and, and, and that's real. I mean, let me not test your credulity. Obviously, we had some favorites, I mean, out there in public life uh, who perhaps got more or less thorough coverage than others, but I can't remember which ones they were. I'm just confident they were. I mean, because that, unfortunately, is human nature. But uh, yes, we covered government very aggressively. And that is widely understood in a modern American journalism to be a turnoff. And there were those who wanted to know why we covered it so much because it was so boring for so many of the stories. And it was because that is the record of what is happening in this community to its people, to its tax money, to its infrastructure and the rest. And that's what we're going to do. Did it hurt your readership or help it? I have no earthly idea. All I can tell you is that um, the most common complaint I would hear, and I'd go to coffee every morning uh, with a bunch of guys at three different tables, half of whom are really quite strong enemies, and we would talk about it. And, you know, when they were not being amused, they'd say, that is so boring. Why are you covering all that? The other time they would say, wow, how did you catch him doing that? I mean, you know, and, or isn't that idiot ever going to learn that you cannot put that gravel down without a work order? which represents some decision uh, by the Board of Supervisors. I mean, it would depend. You know, one of the interesting things about Greenville was the friendships and partnerships that would take place there. They were a little different from other towns in the state. One example being your longtime friendship uh, with Clark Reed. Uh, you were part of the New Democratic Party in Mississippi. Uh, Clark was uh, uh, the head of the Republican Party in Mississippi and the National Republican Party at one point. Uh, he was Mr. Conservative, you were not. <laughs> uh, That's a nice way to put it. Uh, <laughs> how, how, does, how does a friend like, friendship like, uh, the Democrat even once ran a series of stories on an SBA investigation into uh, Clark that turned out to be uh, unfounded. Turned, out, turned, turned out. out not to right. have teeth. But how, how does that, how does that play out? Uh, well, now I'll, I'll tell you a little story because uh, I don't think it's a folk story. I think it's accurate, although I've told it so many times now around home that I begin to wonder if, like my dad, my stories have gotten taller than the truth. But in any case, at some point in the early 1960s, uh, a guy who had been the editorial page editor of the New York Herald Tribune, which was the last bastion of the regular old Eastern establishment republicanism, Ray Price came to see us. Uh, a couple of our reporters had gone from Greenville to the New York Herald Tribune, one the deputy uh, at the time, editorial page editor. And Ray wanted to meet some people that I thought would be sort of representative of both black and white leadership. And Clark lived about four doors away from me on this little residential place called Kirk Circle. So we went down to eat dinner with him, Ray Price and me, my wife, Clark, Judy, whoever. Well, some of you may have heard that in the Delta, from time to time, people drink a lot. Uh, you may have heard that they do it often 
a lot. And it can be safely said that those of us in Greenville did a lot of that. And that night, we drank a fair amount and stayed up till about 2 o'clock yelling about politics. As we were going out the door, taking Ray back to our house to go to bed and Clark to bed, Ray turned to him and said, what in the name of God are you doing in the Democratic Party? You're a Republican. You need to get out of this thing and get on with the business of building a Republican Party, said Mr. Price. It is not true that this was a reason, but I like to tell the story because this part is true. Three weeks later, Clark is down in Jackson raising the banner announcing this new coalition of white boys who are going to retake the Republican Party from the black and tan where it had been since it was a party of Lincoln and recreate a Republican Party, which would be a party of white conservatism. And God knows we were at political war from then on. But we were socially good friends, and besides which, we both like to talk about and tell a lot of political lies, and it's hard not to like people who like to do the same thing you like to do. And we traded that a good bit, and there certainly were times that we were adamantly opposed. And I had many a night with him sitting on my floor saying, I don't know how you bums do it, but congratulations. And in later years, I've had too many times being on his floor having to say, congratulations, you dogs have won again, I mean, nationally. But there were a bunch of folks like that in Greenville. Let us not get carried away. There were people who would cross the street to avoid having to acknowledge me. There were people in some of the clubs who would look straight through me, would never shake hands, and all that kind of jazz. But uh, we, we were close. I went to Clark's 80th birthday celebration up in New York at uh, some place famous. I can't remember the name of it right now. I walked in to see Clark, his daughter, his wife, in this second floor room that had been reserved. And Pat and I walk in there and we embrace and say hello. And next guy I see is a shining eyed, cherubic looking fella. He says, Hotting, how you been doing? It's been a long time. I said, I'm fine, Carl, how are you? And it was Carl Rove, straight out of the White House, come to pay courtesies as a very close friend. A man who, by my standards, is red of fang and claw. And by his standards, I am another kind of red of fang and claw. And we've known each other uh, because of our participation in the youth groups earlier of the parties and then the parties a long time. He sent a note three days after that party, and he, uh, it had been a long, liquid party with lots of jazz being played and blues and stuff. And he sends a note that says, good being with you. He said, I now understand why you and Clark are such good friends. What I don't understand is how either one of you is still alive <laughs> after, <laughs> after that hard living all these years. And uh, that's part of it. But I just had dinner with him the other night talking about the only thing you talk about in my section of the Delta these days, which is how are you going to keep the place from blowing away? What are we going to do about reversing the population depopulation figures?